Welcome again to what will be the final recording for this series, MDG's NATO 1961, uh, postulating Cold War gone hot uh, with the Berlin crisis in early of 61. This was before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so a little recap here where we're at. Uh, there was a pre-war period. You can see that in the previous recordings. Um, the problem, initial problem was too many uh, East Germans were using East Berlin to West Berlin as a way to try and escape Communist Germany. This was causing a problem, stability of the East German government. And there were a number of escalation steps uh, that occurred. Uh, the the uh, Warsaw Pact or the Soviets built the wall. I believe in this case we uh, tore down the wall, then we started an airlift. Um, the NATO side started an airlift, kind of like the Berlin airlift again. Then we started getting uh, maneuvering of the forces to the front, mobilization, and then ultimately the conventional war triggered. But the problem was um, on the world opinion table we rolled automatic escalation and we went right from limited war to tactical nuclear war. Now the positions at the time gave the Soviets the advantage uh, and if you go back and see the recordings you see they could selectively move forward and destroy units before they could respond. Uh, the NATO problem was their tactical nukes were tied up with the US and the UK forces. So out of the box the Warsaw Pact or specifically the Soviet forces uh, targeted their tactical nukes to destroy UK and US units before they could use their tactical nukes and push back their headquarters. Um, air power didn't really take off. The Soviets actually used, because they got the surprise attack, their air power was able to deliver tactical nuclear strikes uh, before NATO air power could respond, which they also used to move back headquarters, etc. Uh, NATO did get a few strikes in the first day, but then if you look at the recording of the second day, the Soviets had pretty much overrun northern Germany especially, threatening the Ruhr Valley area. And uh, they didn't have to use their air power anymore, so they banked their air power. They had four, and then the NATO only rolled for two. So NATO air power, again, would have been counteracted by that. So now NATO found itself in the previous phase, well in this phase we're in right now, we're at the beginning of the NATO phase of M plus 2. And this is the situation, we haven't even gotten to movement yet, um, but you do see that uh, yeah, a number of tactical nukes have been used, Hamburg's been isolated. Uh, the main problem is all these Soviet units, the Soviet units have two strikes each, the headquarters have five salvos they can use. Right now the only unit here is this UK headquarters. They can do five salvos and I mean, you can move up and maybe attrit these guys. But then ultimately, you know, he'll be beat back and there'll be enough units to get within range where uh, at this point they're probably going to destroy these units with tactical nukes which will potentially begin to cause uh, these smaller nations to collapse. Um, down here, got a little more of separation, but the, uh, the U.S. headquarters, these two units, this unit and this unit, these only have one salvo, they're reduced, are the only units that can launch tactical nukes down here in the south. Um, and, you know, if he does move up to get within range, I guess he, he could but then he will be destroyed later. Um, there aren't that many more reinforcements coming either for the NATO side, just a handful. Uh, so they may be able to get a few strikes in and whittle away here, but ultimately if you look at what's coming behind, because let me get this out of the way, um, Berlin has fallen. All these Soviets now are going to come forward all with their own tactical nukes. And if we look at the turn record chart, we're at the tail end of man plus two, it's still more uh, reinforcements coming in. 
while all NATO has is well this turn they're gonna get the 101st and some French units and that's it um, so the combination of inability to really deliver tactical nukes in response to what the Soviets are doing and the large amount of forces coming across here uh, kind of puts NATO in a predicament. Uh, I did actually calculate the victory points and we see here that this is Warsaw Pact at 111, um, NATO's at 126, but this is easily switched. Uh, j if we just stuck to the tactical nuclear board here, uh, this will flip this turn due to a combination of casualties and uh, either the Warsaw Pact capturing Hamburg here or if they if they ended up doing tactical nukes that would take 15 points from NATO and it lead closer to West German collapse and then they'd get the victory points for that so based on all those things being added up I mean NATO only has uh, there is a ceasefire mechanism but with this point spread and the Warsaw Pact basically sees no reason to accept the ceasefire so it could shift world opinion but uh, world opinion a modifier wouldn't be enough to really change the scope of the battlefield so the ceasefire route probably doesn't work I mean there is the out and out surrender if we take this out of the game mechanics and say surrender now I don't know what the terms would be Germany reunified under Soviet control or I don't know what the French would do at this point or the UK so what the US player decided to do to at least get the attention of the Soviets or remove their threat um, potentially from you know the home from a strategic nuclear basically defang the advantage if you look at the numbers here the advantage NATO has is well they do obviously have more ICBMs um, this is a, so many intermediate range but these are stuck to be in theater so they can't <coughs> can't be used <coughs> for counter value strikes on the US UK or Canada which are all off board and they do have some bombers um, what I didn't take into effect is these have an impact these are early diesel boats with uh, 200 k kilometer range SLB uh, ballistic missiles nuclear ballistic missiles with a, a big yield probably sitting off the west coast and the east coast of the US and the rules say there's no way to strike these now me being an ex-submariner I would think our fast boats would be hunting these be in trail and these submarines had to surface to launch which takes away their stealth so I would hope well I would hope it wouldn't come to this obviously that's the conclusion of this game here but I would hope that our fast boat fast boats would be in trail and be able to take some of these out but for the sake of the game the rules are can't strike these and our Polaris's actually these were used in the strike against the Soviet bombers um, and if these SS, if these uh, SSBNs weren't out there, well, they're SSBs, they're, in, they're diesel powered. If these weren't out here, then we would have successfully taken away, <coughs> <coughs> removed the Soviet capability, excuse me, try and get my cough switch faster, uh, removed the Soviet capability to strike places like the US, Canada, UK, but the Soviets still retain this capability so this is what they have left and a whole bunch I'll bring over the spreadsheet a whole bunch of yeah they still got uh, 48 SS threes and a hundred SS fours that can be used on the map so they could inflict a lot of destruction here um, but here's here's a bigger problem there is a rule here I mean there were a, a lot of I mean all the US ICBMs were launched 
all of their um, Polaris missile submarines launched their weapons and uh, there's a whole bunch of these launched this counterforce against the SS-4s. Now I'm going to make an assumption. Um, anybody who's listening who knows better can correct me if I'm wrong. These SS-4s and SS-3s had a thousand kilometer plus range. So I'm going to assume they were stationed in European Russia. Uh, you'll see why that's important uh, when we figure out the collateral damage here. Okay, so launching all these will cause a population loss. And if we want to look at the rules to see that, um, pull that across here, I think it's down here, collateral damage. In addition to counterforce losses, counter value loss, that's population losses, are incurred due to collateral damage. Number of hundreds of thousands of casualty points is mainly what we're focusing on equal to the number of warheads, so we're not multiplying by the yield. So we just want warheads here as collateral damage. So adding this up, we can see 17 atlases here, 30 atlases here. This is a big one, European Russia. We launched all of our IRBMs, 60 and 45, 105 warheads there. And then we see here, um, this is really 3 times 16. There, it had 0.5 yield. But you get 3 times 16 plus 5, you get 53 here. 2 times 16 plus 5, you get 37 here. So based on the collateral damage rules uh, for counterforce strike, this, and this is all inflicted on the Soviet Union, the USSR. And if we come down here, I did collate the collapse numbers. The Soviet Union does have the highest, but they collapsed based just on the counterforce strike. Okay. So they're collapsed. Okay. That means off the bat, uh, if I read it right, uh, NATO gets 209 victory points. Um, so, I mean, if we're playing purely from a victory point point of view, um, you know, if the game ended now, NATO would win. But the Soviets can make a response. And again, we learned with the last one, with a counterforce, normally with these strikes, it's um, tit for tat, you know, one one side launches an, an attack, the other side, the other side, the other side. But a counterforce strike is simultaneous series of attacks against an opponent's strategic nuclear arsenal. Okay, the attacking or firing player announces in conduction uh, the opponent may not conduct any nuclear strikes himself until the announced counterforce strike is resolved. Uh, so, one option the Soviets have is they can use their remaining... Uh, there's nothing to target here on theater. I mean, NATO used all their intermediate range ballistic missiles. But uh, they can use these against, if they want, the B-52s. Um, which is great, but, you know, there's still 855 B-47s, just that alone. Um, and then the B-58 Hustler, while it's only one yield, it's four warheads. And we'll look at counter value in a second. So if they did choose that route, I think I figured it out, it was like 114 dice. Uh, this is close to, uh, you know, 20 times 3 is 6. The 120 down 3, down 6, 114. So in theory, assuming average dice rolls, 114, that would be 354 plus 36, we'll say 40, 394, 400 B-52s could be destroyed on the ground. But again, um, even with that, there's still 855 of these. Okay, So then the Soviets would have no strategic nuclear capability, while the U.S., this is why the U.S. used all these, they still have all of these. I mean, even if this is whittled down to 100, you know, that's the most powerful weapon here, four warheads with a five yield, but there's still these. I mean, this, this is off the charts. 855. I mean, there is a bomber penetration table, depending on how you use them. Um, 
at this point there is no there, there is no reason though for the US to target the USSR anymore they've collapsed so if this really happened then then basically the storyline is uh, NATO did a counterforce strike and they caught the Soviet strategic bomber and nascent because there aren't that many ICBMs here and some of the IRBMs because they did target it with theirs caught them flat-footed and destroyed all these and they caused enough collateral damage from a population point of view uh, especially in uh, European Russia combining the IRBM sites and you know the bomber sites which are pretty much everywhere but they caused enough collateral damage to cause the USSR itself to collapse which means amongst other things they keep fighting but all their units are reduced immediately um, and like I said 209 victory points so if this had happened um, my guess would be that uh, the Gulfs would not be told to do a counterforce strike their country's already collapsed the Gulfs will be told to take revenge so they surface off the east and western seaboards of the United States and do a counter value strike and let's talk about that that's why it's so big counter value strike select a target nation and roll a number of dice equal to the product of the warheads and the yield of the strategic some of the dice is a number of casualty points inflicted on the target nation all right. Um, these aren't bombers. These are uh, submarine launched. Well, not very long ranged. Uh, they're actually scuds. They're a flavor of scud. Hence, hence, they only have a 200 kilometer range. But America, U.S. is concentrated on the east and west, western seaboards. So the Gulf's surface, and then they all fire. And if we do the math here. And, and this is a difference now. Um, this is not like collateral damage where we, where they were targeting specific weapons. Now, in the last throws of the Soviet Union, they target the population centers on the east and western seaboards. So you multiply all three of these numbers. That's how many dice you get, and then that's how many you kill, um, how many casualty points you cause. Now, I'm going to keep this simple. The Gulfs give the order, launch everything against you know US targets because we've already collapsed and suffered casualty losses uh, so like I said this is 114 if you multiply that together six yeah that's 114 and if we come here and we just assume averages I mean just the hundred 354 casualty points um, doesn't matter okay now the US collapses and the points I'm just gonna say that's what happened uh, last command of the Soviet government whatever nuclear power whatever is launched now there's still these left okay there's still some of these left um, and these could do counter value strikes against all the other nations but you know that's just going ad infinitum at that point so I'm gonna change the narrative a little um, we're just gonna call it here so all the submarines launch the east and west coast are devastated all the big cities up and down the east and west coast causes enough casualties DC goes to that uh, the US is considered collapse now all the units go to half strength well most of them are gone due to tactical nuclear strikes so both these countries have collapsed okay um, and now the people on the board are left with a decision none of the other <coughs> none of the other com countries have collapsed the main other country you know the US USSR collapsed I view that as far as their governments not functioning uh, the troops in the field aren't getting commands etc I don't know what the Soviet troops would do but at this point I'm gonna make an assumption that um, everybody is shocked here we are at M plus two and basically the Soviet Union and the USA in some sense of uh, um, oh pretty much destroyed each other uh, West Germany is not in good shape either a number of these you know these have been in big cities either now East Germany and Czechoslovakia are untouched uh, so you know 
I'm going to just assume the bombers don't flush. I mean, the submarines take things out for whatever reason. You know, if these were unleashed, uh, well, that would be the end. So I'll assume that the U.S. and USSR governments are uh, not operating at this point. And now these European-based governments have a choice to make. Um, seeing what happened to the U.S. and the USSR, seeing what's happening to uh, West Germany, these East Germans, the Czechs, the Poles, talk to, well, what's left of the West Germans, but also the French, the Low Countries, and the UK, uh, while their army is destroyed, they're still intact. And seeing all this destruction, they declare a ceasefire and try and spare Europe from that same fate. Um, you know, if they did want to keep fighting, which seems crazy at this point, uh, uh, potentially the U.S. bombers could come into play and, you know, you can base uh, the number of warheads is the number of salvos. Uh, 500 B-52s with 4 D-6. They could just kind of fly around and destroy stuff. Okay. But 150 SS-4s could, with one salvo at least, could start destroying stuff here. So, still enough in the arsenals of the U.S. and the USSR if they were given, you know, this kind of go-for-it-all command, which would be kind of crazy at this point, they could pretty much waste Europe uh, with what's remaining, the SS-4s mainly, and the, USS bo the U.S. bombers. So I'm going to make the assumption, though, that order does not go out, and that the Europeans say, this is crazy, what are we doing, let's stop, okay? Um, East Ger uh, West Germany's got some recovery to do here. Uh, what they post state, of, you know, what the world would be like at the end of the war, uh, I don't know at this point, but these governments agree to stop the madness. Okay, and that pretty much is the end here. Um, so I would tweak the victory points. One more thing we have to add. So the only thing that changes now is these points get added to each side. So the USS, the US goes, and that's 184 points to the Warsaw Pact here. 295, but it looks like um, 209 go to the USSR. I mean, 209 go to NATO. Yeah, here it is right here. That's the points for collapsing the USSR. And strictly going by the victory points, um, yeah, NATO's won. Uh, I don't think if this happened in real life, anybody would view this as a win. Um, so you do see here that it escalated out of control, pretty much. Uh, Soviets used tactical nukes, gained surprise, quickly steamrolled. Uh, a little slower down here, but if Soviet resources came down here, their tactical nukes would come into play primary target being delivery mechanism for from the US tactical nukes okay so at that point it was either surrender or uh, the US sends a message and they kind of thought well if we keep these guys in our back pocket we can take out their stuff unfortunately uh, didn't calculate for these gulfs again I'd question from a realistic point of view how many of them would successfully launch but Still, off the east and west coast, if they can get there, um, that's a pretty large yield than normal, they could uh, decimate major cities along the east and west coast. So, we'll just say that causes the U.S. government to collapse. Um, and then in, in the midst of all that, everybody else out here says, uh, this is crazy, let's stop here. Okay. Now, I do want to point out, this is an interesting, uh, you know, some of you would look at this and say, this this wasn't going to happen, or whatever. Or, you know, could we use control tactical nukes? I found this interesting article, and I'll put it in later. Um, this is a longer one, but this is the last recording I'm going to do. This is something in the national interest. It talks about it here, and it's talking about now, after the fact, after the Soviet Union had fail, fallen, they got access to him 
uh, in information, and we're talking 1961 here. So it's not that, you know, it's still a little after World War II, so peop the thinking on nuclear weapons may have been a little more, they're just another type of weapon, at least in the Soviet side. So here's what the article says. <coughs> Specifically, the Soviet war planners rightly anticipated the United States and allies would resort to a massive use of nuclear weapons early in the conflict. Um, that was always their concern. That uh, whoever got the first attack nuke strike off, in theory, you know, that they would win. So as a result of that fear, they hoped to preempt their use in order to protect Soviet and Warsaw Pact territory. So while well, uh, the world opinion forced us up into tactical nuke, but what I'm reading here says this may have been, you know, at least part of the Soviet Union's plan all along. Um, Warsaw Pact clans called for 189 nuclear weapons. 100, these, these are tactical nukes. They had lots of these, I'll put it. 177 missiles, 12 bombs, 5 kilotons, nuclear weapons central and southern. Larger nuclear weapons would have been used to just go through Hamburg, Bonn, Munich, Hanover. Um, kind of restrained from that, from the game point of view, for victory points. Uh, Copenhagen, Austria would have been targeted. And they had this notion that tactical nuclear weapons just was a way, I think they call it, to prepare the battlefield. They would destroy all the opposing forces, cities, and their, their troops would just drive through and claim the land. Okay, 600 bases, Eastern Europe, non-Russian the time the Soviet Union collapsed, there was 20,000 tactical nukes. And their implications is earlier there was more. Okay. Um, and there is some truth here. There, uh, the uh, British and the United States were planning, tended to drop alone 40 nuclear bombs in the event of war, because they realized conventionally they couldn't stop them. Um, what made it different here is uh, NATO believed nuclear weapons were an endpoint. I mean, they were the final statement. Moscow believed nuclear weapons would only be one part of the fighting and not even decisive. Okay. Um, contrast, so nuclear weapons would be used to shape the overall battlefield. Well, it would shape it in the sense that opposing forces would be struck with tactical nukes before and all the Soviet units and the Warsaw Pact would have to do is drive and take the land. And that's the convention. So you kind of see a mix of World War II and nascent nuclear planning. And the Soviets were viewing it as a battlefield prep weapon, uh, kind of maybe a super artillery or something. Um, and then contrary to U.S. doctrine, a massive Soviet bloc would have made on not only use of nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, etc. Okay. So it was definitely in the plan, and there is a scenario in the game, I think it was seven days to lie on, where that checks, they found a plan where they were going to use liberal use of nuclear weapons in the Czech army, which we do see is rather big, uh, was going to go and conquer Lyons in southern France. Okay. Um, then we'd conquer the rest. Yeah, and then they even question the ability. I mean, with all this radiation and nuclear combat going, if even they could drive through that stuff. Um, but the point I'm making is, you know, or the article's making here is, it's it was they were serious about this in 19 in the 60s and late 50s, um, partly because they thought NATO was going to do it, so strike first. And I think what we saw here is what probably would have happened. Um, interesting quote here: Dwight Eisenhower realized early on that nuclear weapons were not, or atomic weapons, were not just another weapon. But nuclear war was unwinnable. He came to that conclusion in the 50s. Uh, one thing he was dead sure of, no one was going to be the winner in such a nuclear war. Destruction might be such that we might have ultimately to go back to bows and arrows. That common thing that World War III would be fought with, you know, tanks and advanced artillery, you know, and nuclear weapons in World War IV would be fought with bows and arrows, or knives, or whatever. I, I don't know who did that quote, but it looks like it originates from Dwight Eisenhower. You might as well go out and shoot everyone you see, and then shoot yourself. And, based on these plans that have been unearthed, that's what the Soviets were planning on doing. Um, 
you know, some of the planners thought they would have a response to tactical nukes, they can knock them down, but uh, I think we saw probably what would have happened if this plan had been fulfilled. These tactical nuclear weapons and the surprise attack and removing the delivery mechanism of tactical nuclear weapons from the U.S., uh, you know, and the U.K., we saw that in the game, that was their primary target. And then they just used it to prepare the battlefield, as they said, or clear the battlefield, and then just drive through here and claim the territory. Now, if they really did that, I mean, what territory would they have? Uh, you know, especially if they had to keep using them as they move forward, probably into the Low Countries and, and to France. Okay, And that also operates under the notion that the U.S. is ultimately going to stand by and let this happen. Um, I doubt that. Hence, uh, I would think one of the options the U.S. had in the case when it was going south, like we saw, uh, ceasefire, they weren't going to listen, surrender wasn't an option. Well, let's do a counterforce strike. Um, unfortunately for the U.S., the joker in the mix, in the deck, was these SSB, SSBs. Um, I'd be interested, just coming from my point of view, to think how many of these would actually have worked and how many of these golfs would survive coming to the surface and launching right off the coast, since I would be hoping that there would be fast boats in trail on these. But it's 1961, so you don't know. But this was enough off of the coasts to cause enough casualties to cause the U.S. to collapse. And hence we come to our ending here where the European nations here step back and say, stop it, stop the madness, okay? We've done enough. Now, that doesn't mean there might be sporadic fighting here, more tactical nukes. I have no idea how this would resolve itself. This is truly where we get all those dystopian situations here and what the world will be like. So, this has been an interesting exercise. Um, in my mind, it kind of examines a period of history, examines a type of warfare that's still present today. Um, and I would say the conclusion today should be the same conclusion that Dwight Eisenhower came in the 50s. Nuclear war is unwinnable. I don't think there's such a thing as controlled use of tactical nukes. Honest, uh, to be honest, especially if it starts giving one side an advantage over the other. Then their choices become stark. Um, surrender or escalate. And when you escalate beyond tactical nukes, now we're talking about um, Armageddon. And I like his quote, you might as well go out and shoot everyone you see and then shoot yourself. That's what nuclear war is like. So maybe a lesson for us today. It's not something to be considered. Uh, again, uh, like I said, my previous experience, I was on a SSBN in the Navy, and the point of us was not that we were there to destroy the enemy. The point of our SSBNs was that we were to deter them. They could not find us. We would respond, just like these golfs did. Therefore, they did not attack us. So... You know, these golfs, though, here in this case, uh, they kind of brought the whole thing to an end. So, thank you for listening to this series. Um, any of your comments, uh, questions, feel free to drop a line. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we end with the, the movie War Games, where, I don't know the exact quote, but where the computer says... Uh, something about it. it's, it's not a game to be played, nobody wins. And I think this uh, NATO 61 here, when we did exercise the whole nuclear side, uh, pretty much uh, seems to follow that pattern. We see what happened and uh, all I can say is we are so lucky that uh, in 1961 it was very tense in Berlin. It could have gone either way. So this could have been if things got out of control. The same thing with the following Cuban Missile Crisis. It could have gotten out of control, especially with those submarines that were down there with the tactical nuclear torpedoes that they had authorization to fire. Read about that. It was one man who stopped. A three, man, three men had to agree, 
and one of them didn't on one of the submarines. I think it was a squadron commander. And there we were on the brink, too. Then I think there was another case in the late 70s during the Carter administration, NORAD. I believe they were, had a simulation program for their computers that simulated a full nuclear war and a launch. And somehow that simulation program executed uh, on its own. I don't know the details, but literally everybody was woken up saying the Soviets are attacking. Only at the last minute somebody called in and said, wait, it's a simulation. And then the last example I know of is in the early 80s, the Soviet colonel in their early warning site, early warning control center, uh, the Soviets had kind of satellites up there to detect infrared launches like we did. Theirs weren't as good as ours. And one of them gave uh, indication that a missile had launched, and the colonel said this makes no sense. So he didn't call it into Moscow. Then some more missile launches. And he still said this didn't make any sense. He didn't call it into Moscow. And yes, it was proved to be um, a malfunction with their early warning system. Because if he had called it into Moscow, like uh, their pro procedure was, Moscow's response would have been launch everything. So uh, yes, there's been a number of close calls. And Berlin 61 potentially was one of them. So on, on that, thank you very much for listening. Any comments? Uh, I found this instructional, hopefully you did, and the conclusion is don't play the game. Uh, nuclear war is not winnable. Listen to the words of Dwight D. Eisenhower. And on his words, I will end this. Thank you.